welcome everyone to Art Talk presented by the Phillips Mill Community Association. I'm your host, Laura Womack, and with me is Art Talk producer, Jen McHugh. Painter, writer, teacher, and so much more, Robert Beck doesn't need an introduction. He's very well known, having shown widely throughout the region, stretching into New York and Philadelphia and beyond. So I thought it might be fun to share some details of his career that I personally found interesting. Um, Robert used to host a weekly interview program on community radio. He left a business career to pursue art. Um, he had a, and he has a solo exhibition. This is not a, a quirky detail about him, but um, very exciting. He has a solo exhibition coming up at the Michener Art Museum in August. We're hoping that we will all be able to go see that on mass, as I'm sure there'll be a big demand. Mm -hmm. um, we're very excited to have him join us today for what I expect to be a wide ranging conversation just from the conversations I've already had with him. <clears throat> join us with your comments and questions by typing into the Q&A. Jen and I will work them into the conversation as we go along. So Robert, welcome very much to our talk by the Phillips Mill Community Association. Thank you. Um, I, I missed about 10 seconds in there and I think you just introduced me. Uh, <laughs> and I wanna say hi to Bruce from Wales. You're right, there is somebody from Wales and I recognize the name as it came up. Um, Thank you so much to, to both of you, uh, Jen and Laura, for all the effort uh, you've put in to make this program happen tonight. You've also done a stellar job uh, putting on the show at Phillips Mill this year under unprecedented, unprecedented times. You know, you didn't, you didn't have a roadmap. You had, to, you had to figure out how to put on a show and, and make it work. And not only was it a good show, but I understand you, you were really good for the artists that participated. You sold a lot of work and, and that's good too. Thank you for your efforts for the arts community. We certainly do appreciate it. Well, that's very nice to hear Robert for um, Jen and the art committee and myself and the Phillips Mill Community Association. We really appreciate it. We did work hard. We thought it was a beautiful show. I mean, the artists really put out their best work and we're so grateful for that. Uh, Robert, you are a person of great energy. Um, your career and your pursuits have reached into many different avenues. Um, and you've told me that you have, you finished 4,000 paintings. That's a lot of paintings. Does that include everything you've ever done? Is that your student work as well? Did you keep them all? Were they all good? Well, you have to understand, I, I started when I was 40, so I had to make up for a lot of time. Um, it, it's, I, can, I consider any you know, finished work. Uh, yeah, summer sketches uh, include student, include uh, um, going to figure sessions and stuff uh, such as that. But yeah, when I sit down and start a painting and I'm done a painting, uh, I'm, I'm logging that and it's a, it's a general statement. When you think about it, um, okay, somebody does five paintings a week, uh, you're looking at you know, a thousand paintings. I got that right? Um, 50 times, no, uh, 250 paintings a, a year. Every four years you got a thousand paintings. Every, you know, in 40 years, you got 10,000 paintings. So um, they can accumulate. They're kind of like gerbils. And, uh, and most artists will tell you that because a lot of artists I see, they have them all over the place. You know, they're behind the sofa, they're down in the basement, they're just all over the place. It's, it's an impressive number, but it's not a unique number. For the people I know, the, they work very hard. So you said, you've said you said too that your process has changed over the years. Is that deliberate or is that just an evolutionary process? I think everybody, um, it's an evolutionary process. I think most artists, um, you, you, have to, you have to go through the learning how to speak 
and then get to the stage of finding out what it is you say. And, and that's the general arc of things. And you start out, you're copying, you're learning from other people what they do, all of those sort of things, the rudiments, um, what colors do, how perspective works. With, um, but then as you start getting closer to finding out what it is you do as an artist, it, it changes and, and your process changes as you pursue that. You're not pursuing what you think a painting is. You're not trying to paint a red field. You're trying to paint it back. So, and you're not quite sure what that is. So you got to find out what that is. It's a whole, your head's in a different spot. All right. Well, let's take a look. You've sent ahead um, images of some of your works and that show the process. Jen, if you can help us by putting those up, let's take a look. Um, Jen, can, can I have, uh, just for the heck of it, give me uh, Doug's boat complete. Oh, okay. Okay, um, I hope everybody can see this, I can. Uh, this is a painting that's done from life. And I brought two examples of uh, process paintings. And uh, this one is a completed painting. It's 18 by 24 done on site. It took about five and a half or six hours up in Maine in a boat shed. And I'll show you the finish painting so you can see what I was heading for when I show you the two, the three steps in there. Um, part of walking into this room and deciding you're, you're going to paint this is you, I couldn't get this far away from the boat. So the front of this boat is right up against my nose. Uh, and I have to decide what I'm going to do about that. And it's, it's the years of learning how perspective works and not in a thousand lines on a piece of paper way, but in a... Sorry. In a, okay. <laughs> there we go. Oh my gosh. Okay, that's where I want to be. Oh, sorry, technical difficulties, people. Okay. Okay. Oop. There we go. <laughs> we'll get back to it. You want the there finished one? There we go. There it is. There's the there. finished one. Yes. Okay. Um, so I walk into this room and I've got this big space and it's quiet and I got it all day. The good news is the light's not going to change. And that's the bane of all painters that work from light is the fact that um, the sun's going to move, the shadows are going to move. And those two principal sources of information are going to change in front of your eyes as you're working. And as you, when you become a, a, someone who paints from life, plein air, that's what you get used to. It's what you got to learn. Uh, in this case, um, I had to imagine what's going to happen in this space, uh, how I'm going to capture it. Uh, it's a big space. It's a big panel, 18 by 24 inches. It's a large panel to cover in one shot. So if we can go to the... I can show you the initial drawing I do. And that's called Doug's boat drawing. Nope. There you go. There we go. Now, the thing I, I wanna point out about this is, although I'm, I'm doing these lines that are sort of positioning things, um, it, it almost looks like I'm just touching. I'm making these touch marks on there and Although I'm tr I am trying to determine the shape of the boat, it's a three-dimensional boat, and I got to do it in two dimensions and have it make sense, have it look like it has volume. But a lot of these motions are just that. I'm, I'm touching the panel. I'm having my hand do something so that it registers in my brain. My brain is the master Im imaging area. And... These individual moving my hands cements things. I'm saying 
Oh, there are boxes in the bottom right. Oh, there's something squarish going bottom left. Oh, we've got this grid work in the background. And I'm, obs I'm observing them. And when I touch them and do them, they get cemented in my brain and it forms a path. It's, it be, it's the cliff notes of what I'm looking at. So if we go to the, um, um, uh, what is it, underpainting. There you go. Now this is the next step. It kind of looks like a watercolor, doesn't it? It's a, it's a uh, what I call an underpainting. It's a monochromatic, it's still in what I would call a drawing stage here. But this gives me my values. It shows me where everything is. At this point, I can still move things around. In the, in the initial drawing painting, I didn't, didn't point it out, but there's a person in the boat in the initial drawing painting. Now, there was nobody in the room with me. I put a person in the boat because I wanted a heartbeat. I wanted a person in there because it's a different painting when you don't have them. But I moved that person outside the boat at the top of that ladder on the left-hand side. Uh, in this, constantly through this process, I'm moving things, I'm making new decisions, but I'm bringing it all up together and molding it as it comes. Now we can go to the third one, which would be the uh, starting color. On top of this, this, uh, monochromatic value study that I just did. Now you can see the room I'm in here. And let me point out to you that I am actually facing to the right. My panel is not in front of me as I'm painting because that would block my way. It's off to my right and I'm looking over my left shoulder at the scene I'm painting. And you can see that it's kind of crowded and there's stuff all in there and it's very busy. Uh, I'm starting at this point, moving from back to forward and applying paint to the mon monochromatic uh, value study that I've created. That's so incredible to see it come to life. Do you, I know you've done some um, paintings where you've, you've followed your process along. But this is, you've just documented the painting as it emerges, is that right? Um, I'm sorry, I, di I didn't quite understand the question. So these pictures are, are of um, the work as it emerged along. You, um, you, I know you've, you've um, tracked your process before, but you haven't preserved these um, canvases, right? This is the process of the painting emerging. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, covering, the, I'm covering it as I go. So the, the, I, I don't own a, well, I don't know how I would do it, but I, I, don't, have a, I don't have an example that right. I could actually put in a room and say this was, I'd, ha I'd have to sit down and paint those. And that would be, that would be painful to do that, to tell you <laughs> the truth. So uh, I'd rather just take pictures as I go. And this is actually, four of these is, um, it's a too big a jump to make me happy. I've done some that uh, I set my uh, set my phone, and every every twelve or fifteen minutes, I stop and I take a picture. And sometimes I'll even tweet them or uh, Facebook them, so people can watch me do it live. They can see where I'm standing and so forth. Doesn't that um, break your concentration? I mean, concentration is such an important part of the creative process. I'm amazed that you can, you know, you can set a timer um, out of your head it, and it, it'd be tough. But if you saw some of the places that I painted in, uh, it, the, well, I should say some of the places I painted in um, require a tremendous amount of concentration and it, and it's something I seem to be good at uh, when it's time to lock down focus and uh, let's roll. I'm pretty good at that. That's good. Jen, can we have that back up please? It's, I wanted to um, ask you, Robert, why you chose this particular subject. It's a very interesting perspective on this boat. 
Um, and I would think that the subject matter in a way, I mean, it, it's very demand, demanding, as you say, there's a lot going on here in this painting. It, it makes me tired to think of painting it when I... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah, this, so much this, to do. this is a good view. Now, um, I'm constantly um, defining my language. And, and what I'm looking at here, it is very busy. And it's always a question to me, what in this matters? There's, there's a lot in here that is not specific. Like what's going on under the boat. There isn't all of these individual things going on under the boat. There's something going on under the boat. Uh, same to the extreme left of the painting, like behind the guy on the ladder. What's going on there? Who knows? Uh, but something's going on there. Um, but there's other places that matter where there's much more specificity, that uh, pulley hanging from the ceiling. Um, and that, that strange world of the workbench that you know everything that's on that workbench but you don't know what's on the workbench right. so um I'm, I'm having fun doing this go far enough where it triggers something in me that says yeah that that'll probably trigger it in laura too and uh then I stop and I move on so that I just have the information that, that I felt when I came in and I want you to feel when you came in. The boat itself, well, it's, um, you know, you can't ignore the boat. That, it's a big boat in the room and it's a beautiful boat. It's this great form and it's, um, it's again, it's a hard thing to do because unless you're directly in front of it, it's not symmetrical. Right. But you know it's symmetrical. It's a symmetrical shape that from this, this uh, angle doesn't look symmetrical at all as a drawing. So um, figuring out how to make that work is a challenge. And every painting I do, I look for the challenge as, as it may be a small challenge, it could be, adding a little uh, a tube of color that I haven't tried before, uh, a position I haven't tried before, a difficulty factor I haven't tried before, but something, I wanna grow with each painting and, and then do a couple of paintings with a little bit of, a couple of thousand paintings with a little bit of growth each time, uh, you might become a good painter. Another thing that strikes me about this painting, Robert, is um, the background is so cluttered um, and yet the boat is just as simple as it could be. Uh, and it's this smooth surface um, and plain. Um, so that contrast really strikes me that there's also the contrast of the blue um, in the background and yet the boat has this lovely warm tone and yeah, then the so you've got these blue versus yellow thing uh, that it propels the boat forward. The boat has this huge presence in the room. If the background wasn't blue, I probably would have made it blue uh, just to make that happen. But it's a cool surround, a warm forward. There's a tremendous amount of depth in this room. There's also little things that make things advance. As you, as you go along the very top edge of the boat from the bow down the left hand side towards the guy, um, it's very, sh the defining line is very sharp in front and then it gets just a little bit vague as it gets to the guy. Um, that's what helps it propel. You, you make things advance in paintings because they have sharp edges, because they overlap, because they're warmer than what's behind them. There's a, there's a list of things you can do to create dimension in a painting. And that's one of the thing, things I've done there. And even the general center of the boat, uh, if you were to go between the bow and the guy, uh, there is um, a clarity 
um, in the paint, a slightly sharper, slightly clearer, slightly purer color that makes that kind of come out a little bit at you. And it gives a slight curved surface to the boat. Now that's, that's technique, but that's intentional. So what I, I mean, I think this is a really fabulous painting. I am just completely mystified, Robert. You've got this, lab, this ladder in the front that blocks <laughs> it and it gives me, it's, there's so much tension. I know you did that deliberately as well, but that is, that ladder is, I'm having such an emotional reaction to it. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, it, without it, um, it would be a completely different painting. And uh, if, if we get to the second one, I do kind of the same thing. I like to have a, a buffer in a lot of my paintings. I like to give the, uh, um, the viewer a little bit of relief. So. Um, Which one do you want to see, Robert? Oh, I do, uh, do you want to go on to the next one? Whatever, if you want to. That's uh, up to you. Oh, okay. I don't I haven't been answering your questions. I've been babbling. Um, <laughs> it, the, oh, there's it, actually <laughs> someone that has a question that might be. Oh, sure. Um, well, did Jeanette? you finish with the ladder? Did you finish oh, with I'm the ladder? Sorry. Sorry, I just uh, and it, it was just because sometimes I do that. I, I like to put a buffer between the viewer and the, uh, the object. It would be a very different painting if it was just like poking out of it at you. Well, I think it would be. Which it would, it would poke out at you. And I think in a way it would be more sentimental. This gives it attention that I think is. Um, and know, it, makes it, it makes it a quiet, um, a quiet effort that this guy is, he's working alone. It takes right. you out of the painting and gives him the solitude in there. And, and I wanted that. Right. All right. Thank you. Sorry, Jen, please um, go ahead with the question. No, uh, Jeanette asked, we're taught that verticals in perspective are always up and down and straight, but that wouldn't have worked here, question mark. Uh, sorry, regarding the bow of the boat. Okay, um, I wish I wish I, was, I wish I understood that. Um, well, yeah. Robert, one thing I was going to ask you because um, I understand you're excellent at explaining perspective. Maybe you can launch into your explanation of perspective <laughs> here. <laughs> Thank you, but no, that's a little bit too big. Uh, I, I would love to sometimes do a perspective in your pocket kind of. Uh, talk so that people would understand how to make it useful for them uh, out, out in the road um, so that they, they didn't have to be, it's not a thousand lines, it's just like respecting your viewer and, and giving them a perch to look from and how do you make that happen so that it doesn't look wrong. Um, but Kathy, uh, Kathy Schroer. Kathy Schreyer, right? Yeah, she said uh, she wrote something. Uh, we were we were halfway into her question when when we bailed on her. Uh, is that gone now? Um, what well, I think she asked, what's the? A couple of people want to know what's the white thing or panel in the rear? Oh, uh, it's it's a it's a back window looking out on the bay. Right. The, the thing Just that gives you the, the edge of the side of the boat. Yeah, it stands out, and the white draws your eye. Um, Jen, do we have the um, image from the Phillips Mill show this year? Because it's such a contrast to um, what what to this painting that we've been looking at. And we you've got four thousand paintings we could look at, Robert. So we we can't give them all justice. Um, but I did I did my eye, Robert. In every time I looked at the show, which was many many times, um, I was struck by your snowscape. Uh, which is such a, a very different painting. Uh, Jen, and it was in your title page if you um, don't have it on its own. Yep. Sorry to Hold just on. throw that at you. No. 
But Robert, it's such a, um, you know, that, that painting is the epitome of simplicity, it seems to me, or has it such a simple, I guess it's not really the epitome of simplicity, but it, it gave me a very simple and pure feeling when I was looking at it. Yeah, um, that, that painting, uh, what I was going after, what I wanted, wanted to uh, capture was that uh, not beautifulness of a snowstorm, ice storm, the, um, the oh, I'm, I'm not sure I can walk down this roadness of it. Um, the, the slippery, the crunch of the ice, uh, the ice hanging on that. I particularly like the ice hanging on the, the, the wires. Um, and, and I like the naturalness of the wires. The wires are convincing. That would be the way they would be. Um, and not just not just heavy straight lines going across the panel. Um, again, everything to me is developed to the point where it's enough so that you get it and, and, and it, just, it doesn't get overstated. And I, I, I like the simplicity of this. It's, uh, it made me very happy. It made me happy too. And also I'm, I'm just really struck by, it seems like the color palette is very unusual. You have these um, lovely cool blues and sort of uh, bluey grays in the foreground and in the sky you have these these warm um, warm tones over green it's a I mean I think that's not a normal not a not a color story that we see very yeah great. there's actually there's a lizard and crimson crimson in that sky um, which is and at, at that value is it's good like a cool pink so there's, uh, yeah, the color harmony um, is interesting and, and it, it makes sense. Um, it's, it, it's a good harmony for this picture. It's a nice, cool um, winter harmony. Yeah, it's lovely. Um, love that painting. So what else, Jen, do we have of his paintings to look at? I uh, you tell me you ask I've got plenty I can share. Let's well do you have one of his New York paintings up because I think of you as a landscape painter Robert and we have a lot of uh, painters in our area here who spend their time divided between our area and Maine and you do that. Um, I'm assuming that the boat is from Maine, um, but you... Subway Rain or Empire are both. The Subway Rain is a night painting, which is um, okay. something you may want to touch on. So I, I, I'm always surprised to see, Robert, when I, um, you know, look at your website or other sources of your work. Um, you really have a feel for New York as well, and that's such a different subject matter. Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, it's, you can go back. Um, it's all the effects of, of light on form. Uh, it's, it's all a depiction of light and shadow to, to describe form, uh, whether it's a flower or a vase or a building or an airplane. So uh, it has a common root and it's all trying to take a three-dimensional subject and describe it on a two-dimensional surface. Um, there's Subway Rain, um, which uh, I mean, the, we all recognize the um, that fluorescent light lit signage, uh, and even even without the detail. You can recognize those, uh, the circular numbers of the subway system. This is the one at uh, um, Columbus Circle. Uh, and going down, down into the, this, there's, there's so many triggers in this that say, uh, to me, Manhattan, but it could be, could be any city probably, but there's a vast, this, a vastness to this. Um, that, that says Manhattan. 
you you said that your work is all about you. Obviously, you're not talking about doing a lot of uh, self portraits. What do you mean by that? Your work is all about you. Uh, I think um, be, because we all sort of grow up being told that uh, told what art is. We go to the museums. Uh, if you live in Bucks County, you see it. You, I would see it hanging in banks and schools and 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 all of that. Um, it was it was like art was prescribed to you. And and when I got to the point where I found out what I did for me, uh, I took the language I learned when um, when I was copying, visiting other subjects, and turned it towards my life. The things I paint are the world around me, the things I experience. They're, they're my encounters. Um, this is a place I know, and I know it well enough that I can paint it that way. And, and I think you could say I know it well enough that you'd agree that that's probably what it's like. It'll, it, this reminds you of a subway at night in New York, just like it reminds me of it. So now you're experiencing my world. I'm, I'm talking to you about my day when I show this to you. Right, right. Um, you've, you, uh, in that part of that same quote, which I got from your website, I love the quotes on your website. Um, you say that it encourages autocratic behavior. <laughs> Um, which I thought was amusing. It reminded me of um, uh, years ago, I was reading a V.S. Naipaul novel. We, the main character is a, a writer and he has a bunch of guests coming for dinner, but he's in the middle of a, you know, he's on a roll. He doesn't want to stop and break the creative process. And um, so he lets them in and he says, uh, you know, excuse me, enjoy dinner but I have to go back to my typewriter or computer, whatever it was at the time. And, um, you know, so I, I wonder, do you feel that, um, I, I always thought that that struck me, even though I read that 30 years ago, it stayed with me because it feels like the um, creative process sometimes requires you to be very selfish and put that ahead of other things. Um, at this stage in my career, one of the most important um, and difficult parts of it is time and energy management. Um, un understanding what inertia I'm going to need at what time to do a painting that's a studio painting that's going to take five days. Uh, there will be portions that I need to be at that painting for the underpainting part of it the whole time that it happens. Um, and, and there's this story about um, um, Hemingway used to, uh, it may be apocryphal, but Hemingway used to start typing in the morning and, and go until he got to the point where he knew what was gonna come next. And then he'd stop. And then he'd go out and he'd drink beer, go fish and shoot guns, whatever he did, uh, come back, the next morning, sit down at his typewriter and start that new idea that he had let percolate overnight. And when he was finished that idea and knew where he was going to go next, he'd stop and go out and shoot guns again. So he knew the value of letting it percolate. He knew that um, he needed a certain inertia that he could rely on at a time and then not waste because he didn't want to come in the next morning and not have anything to do. He had to have it eating at him. So uh, understanding how you function as an artist is something that you acquire um, as you do it more and more. And, and that's, that's a big part of, of how I work right now is understanding. And, uh, you know, Doreen will tell you there are times when I, ju I just got to go do it because it's hot. Um, I got this thing I got going, I got to go up there and it's fine, take your time. Um, 
you know, give me a call when you think you'll show up again. <laughs> so um, it's, it's, it's an integral part of what I do. And I think we have a question. Jim Feld is working uh, out the composition of the um, painting of the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have that question if, if you can. I think it's in two parts. So we might um, to put that yes, he originally asked uh, from the original mental composition of the piece, how much of the final finished work changes during the process but they said but you've answered that brilliant work thank you so then he followed up and said you can still ask that but from the original composition of the work how much does it change to the final um it can change dramatically um it, it's hard to gauge there is there is no normal there are times there have been times i'll be well into a pain um and take it down uh just wipe it down be solely because i've come up with a better idea I'll, I'll be three quarters of the way into a painting like that and 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 realize that if i was you know five feet from the right or if i put the guy under it or you know something something major uh usually something like if i was closer or farther away, it would be a much better painting. And I'll stop and I'll start all over again. And it's because um, I don't want to look at that painting when I'm done and say, but it could have been better. Um, I, I, I want it to be, I want it to be the best painting it can be. It sounds a little bit like a recruitment, uh, but that's, um, I don't need I don't need to accumulate um, almost good paintings. Right. I'm after the good ones. At least that's that's what I want to go. And I, and and I can't I can't continue if I know that the good one is not going to happen this way. I've got to do it some other way. Well, that's a great answer. Um, Bruce Bensman wants to know um, what kind of boat it is. Too big to be a dory. Do you know what kind of boat is being made? It, it's a lobster boat. It's a 38 foot uh, lobster boat built by Doug Dodge. Um, there you go. Right. Good. Um, so there's talent and there's hard work. Um, but you also say that being an artist uh, is a business. And we often think of art as a calling and something above, you know, so-called um, filthy lucre. Um, you don't have <laughs> you don't have a problem being an artist who's a businessman for his art. I I gather. Actually, I had to be um, because I like to eat. Um, just a little modification on that that concept. Um, the, if you if you want to sell your paintings, um, you have to be a businessman or businesswoman. You have to be a business person. Um, nothing stops you from being an artist. Nothing stops you from making things, uh, painting things, whatever. Um, but if you get to the point where you want it to feed you, if you want to sell them, and a lot of people want to do that just for the validation, if nothing else. Um, um, I see that a lot on Facebook. I sold a painting. Um, and yeah, sure, it feels good. But if you're going to do that, you know, it isn't being an artist that's going to help you sell a painting. It's being a business person that's going to help you sell a painting. And understanding uh, what a customer is, what a, cust what a customer needs, how to approach them. Um, how to sell yourself, how to market yourself. All of those things will help you sell that painting and that will uh, hopefully get you some money so that you can continue to paint. Uh, but they're two separate things. Well, how do you do both? How can you, how do you, um, what are some tips for being a business person artist? 
when well, in my case, I, I don't have a I don't have a formula for that. In my case, um, uh, I was forty years old when I stopped working in the business world and went to the academy and, and tried to make a go of it by myself. Um, those of those when I was forty years old, I had been in the business world for twenty years, and so I had a feel for what was required. I didn't have a checklist of this is how you do it, but I understood you know, what marketing meant. Um, I had to go out and find out how to do it for myself, so I did, but at least I knew I had to do it. Um, so for myself, I had to, had to now, if I can do a, what I was doing was I was painting every morning and in the afternoons and evenings, I would take care of business. Uh, and as most of my work at that period was plein air work, going out and doing a $700 la uh, landscape someplace and it would hang at the Rosemont, Rosemont Cafe and hopefully I'd sell one of those a, a month and, and make rent. Um, but every morning I'd do a painting and maybe, maybe three of them a week or two of them a week might be worth framing and maybe one would sell. Uh, and the rest of my time I'd be doing that framing. I got a job in a frame shop so that I could make myself frames after hours at the wholesale rate and, and just, you know, do it as, do it as a business. Um, the one thing I did do, though, is I, I, I thought of, I called it uh, Bobco, my business, <laughs> Bobco. Um, I, guess I thought of it as made up of, of two departments. One was marketing and the other was creative. And I didn't let the two talk to each other. I created, created the paintings that were going to make me a better painter paintings that I could be proud of and excited about, which would keep me going. I kept, I kept it pure. And then when I was done this painting, I would hand it to marketing and say, sell this. And it was that Bob's job to do that. And I kept them separate because I didn't, I didn't want to be making a living painting kittens in a basket. So do you still sell or do you rely on your gallerist for that? Are you still selling? Is there still Bob, the, the, the marketer? Um, yeah, I, well, I, I work with, I work with a guy, I work with a gal, uh, Morpath Contemporary who represents me at the moment in Hopewell. Um, but up until two years ago, I did it solely myself for 20 years. And um, I, I bring a lot to the table, uh, to a gallery, because um, I know how to do it. I know what their problems are. I've had those problems for 20 years selling my own work. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm a good, I'm a good um, artist to represent. So Jeanette Hoopen asks, um, how do you feel about showing your art on Instagram? She's a painter also, I believe. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the downside that, that would, what would be on her con list for that. Uh, when I'm done one, I show it on Instagram. It's about this big, uh, if somebody wants, somebody wants to show it, that's fine. Um, I, I'm, I don't really expect somebody to take one of my paintings and run down a street and sell it. Um, I got the painting. Uh, it's this big on Instagram. I, uh, so I don't know what the downside is. Um, getting it seen sounds like a good idea to me. As a matter of fact, my, my number one of all of my marketing, if you, if you boil it down to what's the important thing that I'm driving at is I want to get somebody to stand in front of my painting. That's the end game, getting somebody to stand in front of the painting. Uh, after that, um, I, I live or die by the strength of my work. 
if, a, if, it, if it's not good, it's not going to sell. I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, there, there's that aspect of it. And, and I think that any, any gallerist would back that up. I think, I mean, I'm not sure what Jeanette's exact concern is, but I know there are people who are concerned about, you know, what's the proper venue, you know, um, um, you know, someone suggested to us that we should, uh, let me put this to you. Someone suggested to the Phillips Mill Art Show that we should put the show on Etsy. Um, you know, other people felt that that was not dignified. Um. Well, there's a, there's a lot of questions involved in that, including um, what is the purpose of the Phillips Mill Show? Um, and I don't want to get into that here. Okay. Yeah, no, no, I don't either. But I think, but there's just that the, the appropriate- I, I, the I venue, wouldn't, I think I wouldn't load it too much in, in favor of selling artwork is the grail here. Right. Okay. All uh, right, good. Being being the best you can be is the grail, and that's that's as an artist or as an art show, and the rest falls in line. All right. Good. Okay. Mary Flamer was uh, would like to see another painting, um, and uh, I think she's got a good point there. So, <laughs> What else do we have? I don't have the list of paintings that we have images of in front of me. What do we have, Bob or Robert or Jim? What, what should we look at? Um, well, you can look at um, syrup is a fun painting. I mean, if you, if you want a long winded, if you not, want another, another one of those. Oh, uh, wait. There you go. This is a great painting. Yes, yeah. I wanted to talk right. about this one. Yeah, this, this is the other one that I was uh, thinking about when I wanted to talk about process. Um, it's been a crappy year. I think everybody's going to agree with that. When we think about the um, COVID and politics and wildfires, and you can go on and on and on. And it's just been one thing after another. And uh, because I've for the last oh, decade plus, I've been painting my world. I've been painting um, my encounter to things around me. I pay a lot of attention to what's going on. Um, I wanted to, I, I was, I felt like I should at least try and describe this, this world that I'm in at the moment, which is really screwball. And, and so I sat down and, and spent a lot of time thinking about, well, what is it? How do you, there's so much going on there. How do you pick something? So uh, after a fair amount of time, I decided that the thing that um, I wanted to center on as a subject for trying to describe how I felt about now, which was, was concerned scared. Um, I feel so indebted to some people that are uh, giving so much, all of that, there's so much going on that I decided I was going to pick the, um, the medical situation. And it wasn't, this is kind of cut and dry. This is the end game. This is where I land. This is I have many, many hours trying to get to this point and decide what is it I'm going to paint. To include, um, to give you an idea how I go about something like this, uh, I go online and I start collecting photos. And I have a file that has, I don't know, maybe 150 or 200 photos collected off of the web of, um, COVID ward kind of things. And then I will spend hours over days going through it like a flip book, just pushing my down button, going picture, 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 going through it until I get a feeling for which images grab me by the throat, hold on to me. And 
and I did this until I had a, and I separated some of those until I had this file that had a lot of images of hospital workers. Then, uh, then I took one of my sketchbooks and I can't see me at the moment, but I, wa I wanna hold up a sketchbook and show. Is there a way I can do that? Jen, I think if you spotlight Robert, um, we can, he will be held up okay. Okay. Uh, as the main image. So, and you can see that there's these quick little, what we might call croquis in, uh, in the art world. They're these quick, you know, 20 second, 30 second sketches of figures, okay? Now, if you look at this figure, it's gonna be in the center of that, that painting. And these are all, I, I have very many, very many pictures in this book. And I went through and I just drew them, drew them, drew them. So there's that sketching thing where I'm connect, connecting it with my brain, feeding my brain so that I'm kind of one with my subject. Now, while I was doing this of the, of the ward people, of the, the people working in the hospital, uh, my subject was still evolving. Um, can we get back to the painting? Um, the, my subject was still evolving to the, the point where I also had photographs and drawings of young people at the beach having a good time, being very close together. And I had drawings and uh, pictures of people in bars having a good time close together. I even had uh, some pictures and drawings of, you know, that one, that one overweight guy who's waving the American flag in the background of those photographs. <laughs> uh, well, in, in my, when I started putting drawings together of the whole scene, trying to decide what does this room look like? It had those people in it too. It had the guy in the back with the American flag. It had the, uh, the people from the beach and the people from the, the bar mixed in there. Well, there's a statement, you know, um, and I decided that wasn't, that wasn't what I was trying to talk about. That was my anger speaking. That wasn't um, this, this feeling of this moment that I wanted to describe. Now, I, that, that one image of, that I showed you uh, uh, that was in the sketchbook and I said that it was in the, the middle of the painting is the woman in green, the doctor in green in front of the gurney coming towards you. Um, in, in the photo, in the sketch, uh, she only has one hand up. I put the other hand up because to me, that's, that's kind of, having two hands up is kind of like the international sign of anguish. Uh, she's, uh, she's had so much to do and, and has been so beat up. She's coming down the hall and um, the truth is that that's, a, that's a, a dead person on that gurney behind her being walked down the hall. It wouldn't be, wouldn't be those guys doing it if the person was alive. Um, and towards the end of this painting, I left the forward open uh, and decided it was too close. You, the, the viewer was too far into this painting, too part of it. So I put the woman in blue in the front, the nurse in blue, had her connect eyes with the woman coming down the hall. This, this becomes the story that I tell myself. I also added uh, the person on the right compositionally. Um, an, another interaction dealing with the uh, dealing with the IV tray. I learned a lot. Um, I I read. Uh, I I listen to a lot of things just to try to understand what's going on. And this isn't a typical isn't a typical COVID ward because in the United States they're cubicled. This is an early COVID ward and probably, probably a lot of my images I was looking at were uh, from China where they do it different. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't wanna be wrong, but I didn't wanna 
break my stride, break this inertia, trying to get to this point by uh, being too exact to, oh, this has to be Doylestown Hospital or something like that. Um, I just wanted it to be right enough that it said, this is how I feel right now. I think that, Robert, that's such a great description of your process. And Jim Feld had, he wanted you to talk about um, the how your painting changed from, you know, conception to what your subject matter changed from the conception to what you wanted to convey. And I think that's a really great description of that. Um, I just wanted to quickly look at that for a minute more. And then we've got a request for um, looking at the painting from um, Phillips Mill last year of the fishermen out in the storm. Um, but to go back to this one really quickly, because uh, you were talking about with the if the painting of the um, the um, boat builder, how there was not so much detail that where you looked at the detail uh, was what's important. And I'm just struck here that there's so much clarity in this painting. I mean, I think it's extraordinarily clear for your style looking at, you know, even if you look at the New York subway image, there's just, you've gone through on the, given so much detail on the faces of even the people all the way at the back. And I think uh, given what, you know, the place you were coming from to paint the subject, to me, that seems telling. Tell me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, perhaps. I was also moving people around. Um, this, this isn't where, where the supporting cast necessarily started. Um, right. you know, there, there was a lot of adjustment that was happening. I was still discovering um, how I was going to paint this as I went. And so part of the painting process, when I'm in the middle of a painting process, um, I'm going by feel. And if you remember the old radios where you would turn the dial to uh, to dial in a station. You get a little static on one side, a little static on the other. I'm kind of doing that when I'm painting, whereas this, it feels a little better if I do it this way, if I have the person over here, or maybe if I have it up, no, that's not good. I'll try this, but it's all the feel. What does it sound like when I'm looking at it? What am I getting out of this? And uh, so it's this, this communication thing. And, and in all communication, it's not what you say, it's what's heard. So I have to, I have to stop and look at and study and think about what I'm doing because I, I want to feel, what is, what is my viewer going to feel? What are they going to hear? What are they going to get out of this thing? Now, by the way, this is two foot high and four foot wide. So it's not a small painting. No, it's just magnificent. It's great. Yeah. Um, we do have the painting. Um, Carolyn Edelman, I believe, wants to see the fisherman out in the storm. I hope this is the painting that she's talking about. Um, was was this last year's? I can't remember. My brain doesn't file things away, images away that way. I can't remember um, either if that was last year. I think it might have been. Uh, it, it's, not a storm, but um, it's fishermen out there. I've, I've done a lot of boats out in nasty weather in the, uh, in the last few years. So, um, Robert, before you, before, you, before you talk about this, I just want to say a couple of things. One to um, Carolyn, Carolyn's point. Um, just a, I, I think people don't always understand the process at um, Phillips Mill and um, the, the awards that are given out are given out by the judges sponsored by, um, by donors like uh, the Bucks County Herald um, that she's referencing. So that's how they're given out just as a point of order. And also we're coming up on the top of the hour, but I'm gonna um, take a point of privilege and go over. So I just wanna let people know we're gonna go a little bit longer so we can talk about this painting. All right, Robert, thank you. Um, this, 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 uh, what to say about this painting? So much of this painting is just out of my head. Um, I spent a lot of time up in Maine. 
this sky was done from just imagination. The water was done from imagination. The boat is one I'm sort of from. I know how a dragger is built for the most part. Uh, I probably uh, I probably referred to a photograph because I want to make sure the rigging is right. Uh, but the the whole uh, the light in the cabin and having it reflect on the guy that's out on the deck that there's a there's a sort of a romance to that that um, that I'm fond of and it's it's also playing that yellow against the blue thing again uh, uh, as well um, I love. I love the feel. I've been out on the, the water at night in the lobster boats and um, with the water from the, the chop kicking up along the side and the, the night is close around you. Um, it, 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 you can smell the water. It sounds very muffled and you can feel the engine under your feet and, and there's a wind and it's just, it's, it's a thing I wanted to grab and try to paint. And um, this reminds me of that. Now, it may not remind somebody who's never been out there of that, but it, it, maybe it gives them an idea of, of how it felt to me. All right, very good. Um, a quick follow-up question. For, well, first of all, Mary, and in regards to the um, Hospital painting says you portrayed the focus and urgency wonderfully, and yet the color gives us confidence. Thank you. Hmm. Um, Thank you. I, it is a really nice painting. Um, and Nancy asks, uh, what color do you tone your canvases? Uh, if I tone a canvas, it's raw sienna, uh, which is kind of an amber color to people uh, who don't know what raw sienna is, but it's kind of an amber color. And why, why that choice, Robert? Um, well, you don't, you don't have to start with white and go darker. Um, that's one way to do it. You can start with black and go lighter if you want. So you have this full range of what to start with. And a lot of artists like to start in the mid range of what we call tone, which would be the lighter, light or dark, and go lighter or darker from that. Um, and I like to start with a colored background. If you were to look at that that painting, you would see the color coming through where where the brush strokes didn't overlap. It's kind of like a uh, uh, creating creating a key for your music or a drone in the background, a musical drone in the background of music, a chord that plays. So it's a unifying feature that um, holds together this uh, color harmony that I'm building the painting out of. Okay, very good. You've got a lot of kudos here, Robert. This will, I promise, be the last question. I think uh, but not forever. <laughs> So could I. <laughs> uh, I could talk to you forever. Okay, Bob Chris would like to know, um, I think about the uh, fishing boat at night. Uh, it's amazing the way you capture the twilight is amazing. Do you specifically go for the blue hour rather than full night? Oh, um, well, for the same reason he goes for the blue hour, which is, is kind of like it's before for uh, full night, uh, Bob Chris is one of the most famous photographers around. Uh, like around, what twice, uh, twice uh, um, travel photographer of the year. He shot for National Geographic magazine. He knows shooting, and that time of day before it gets night. Uh, is when you best capture the lights versus the darks of a city scene at night kind of thing. And so that's that moment he's talking about. And uh, I've learned from him. So yes. <laughs> Great. I'm glad we were able to fit that in. Good. That's nice to know. 
Well, I had I had tons more questions, Robert. I'm sure we all could have enjoyed talking to you more. Thank you so much for joining us. Robert this, Beck, everyone. This is so much fun. Thank you very much. Um, uh, let's see. And thanks, everyone, for coming, for your questions. We're going to be back in the new year. Watch Facegram, Facebook, uh, Facegram. <laughs> Facebook and Instagram for details. Uh, thanks very much to Jen McHugh for producing our talk and to the Phillips Mill Community Association for sponsoring the series. I'm Laura Womack. Everyone have a safe and happy holiday season.